Ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me okay at the back? Thanks so much for coming and welcome. I, uh, my name is Murray Rankin. I'm the Member of Parliament for Victoria, and I'm really pleased to see you here this evening. Um, let me first immediately acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen people, today the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. I want to thank uh, you all for showing up. This is the second event we've had at the City Hall Chambers, and I suppose with Councillor Alto here, I have to say thank you as well for this uh, for this facility being made available to us. It was uh, really wonderful last time, so we're very grateful that uh, we can use these facilities. Um, <clears throat> I want to say initially that the impetus for tonight's meeting, of course, is the historic report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that uh, was submitted in June of 2015. It made some 94 recommendations, or what the Commission called calls to action. And uh, they covered every part of society, uh, civil society, faith-based communities, every level of government. And I, I think we're going to hear a lot about them. One of the key recommendations, though, was that Canada should adopt the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as the framework for reconciliation. And we're going to hear a lot more about that tonight. But we, of course, can't discuss issues of uh, reconciliation without being mindful of other urgent issues that are, are facing our Canada's Indigenous people. And it's our job as members of Parliament, I think, to hold the new government to account for a number of things. Issues like murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, an inquiry that's about to get underway. The failure to find First Nations funding equivalent to that of non-Indigenous communities. And of course, the, the dr dramatic findings of the Canadian Human Rights Commission in the case of Cindy Blackstock, uh, a case where the government's long-standing underfunding of uh, child and family services on First Nations reserves, and uh, it led to ensuring, they said, that Canada's First Nations children must have access to the government services on the same footing, to the same a level of funding as non-Indigenous people. They, they found the Government of Canada, in case people aren't aware of this, having discriminated against 163,000 First Nation children on the grounds of race and national and ethnic origin. So they made that finding, and then just this past April, they issued a second order, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, expressing concern over the fact Canada hadn't implemented those those findings in the decision of the Commission. And a further order is pending. So somehow, we have to make our government listen to these issues. Now I'm going to more fully introduce our special guest, my good friend and colleague, Romeo Saganash, a little later. But for, suffice it now to say that he's going to be talking a lot about the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, which I say is such an important framework. He'll describe what he's doing in a private member's bill a little bit later. But you may have noticed we have not one but two speakers this evening. And I'm very, very pleased as well to, uh, in to introduce in a moment to Councillor Marianne Alto. I wanted to say in terms of housekeeping that we have this room booked until 8.30. So we turn into a pumpkin at about 8.30, the book comes out and we all have to leave. I promise you there'll be ample time for a discussion after the presentations. And if people would like to have a sort of one-on-one -on -one with either of our panelists, Please feel free, we'll make sure there's time left for that purpose. So our first speaker is someone who needs no introduction, particularly in City Hall, and that's Councillor Marianne Alto. She's wearing two hats tonight. Just, I don't see them, but I, figuratively. First of all, she's wearing a hat, the Capital Regional District, where Marianne has chaired the Special Task Force on First Nations Engagement since its inception last year. Its primary purpose, is to redefine how the Capital Regional District includes First Nations in regional governance. But it's also taken on the role of steering the start of a regional response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which you'll hear a lot about tonight. So that's the first hat, the CRD hat. The second hat is the City of Victoria hat, and she's the current lead on the city's emerging response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and still working with First Nations on aspects of that. So she's here to lay out what the Capital Regional District and the City of Victoria are doing to address the calls to action of the TRC. Thanks, Marianne. 
do a quick presentation of about 10 minutes, and uh, then we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have either uh, before or after Romeo speaks. I'm actually going to do it in the reverse order uh, from what Murray suggested. I'm going to talk first about the city, uh, and then a little bit more about the region uh, and what we're doing. <clears throat> so, of course, uh, as you all know, as Murray suggested, uh, this work began, uh oh, and technology is always a challenge. There we go. Uh, work began, of course. Now I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague and friend, Romeo Saganash. Now, some of you may know that Romeo uh, represents since 2011 the people of Abitibi Bay James Ludovic EU. Just a few words there. Somewhere in northern Quebec, I understand it. Here, in Romeo. Romeo has been the member of parliament, as I say, since the election of 2011. He is the first, he speaks fluent Cree, English, and French. He's the first Aboriginal Member of Parliament from Quebec. Um, in his spare time, he has served as NDP critic for energy, national, resource, national resources, international development, deputy critic for intergovernmental Aboriginal affairs. Now, on a personal note, I have to say I got elected in a by-election after Romeo, and he's been so, so very good to me since I, I first met Romeo. In fact, this is not his first visit to Victoria. He accepted an invitation earlier, and he actually tells me he likes this place, which is great to know. <laughs> Romeo was born in Waswanipi, and at age 23 founded the Cree National Youth Council. He became in, uh, involved in the economic development of his region. Romeo was the first Cree graduate to obtain a Bachelor's of Laws in the province of Quebec. He was Deputy Grand Chief of the Grand Council of the Crees. Vice Chair of the Cree Regional Authority, Director of Quebec Relations and International Affairs for the Grand Council of the Crees, and in 1997 he chaired the James Bay Advisory Committee on the Environment. In 2003, he received an award of the recognition from the University of Quebec at Montreal for his role in negotiations that led to the really critical importance signing of the pedigree. The Piece of the Braves uh, on February 7, 2002, between the Cree Grand Council and the province of Quebec. And more importantly, perhaps, than all of that is that he has spent 23 years with the United Nations negotiating the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. I'm thrilled to have Romeo Saganash with us tonight. Thank you, Romeo. Thank you. 
So uh, I'm looking at the time and I certainly do not want to turn to a pumpkin because being, being an Indian is already challenging enough. <laughs> um, I've, been, I've been on the road for the last eight weeks now, I've toured the country, every part of the country, uh, to talk about it's the tour is called Call to Action Tour. It's talk about the human exploration of rights of indigenous peoples as well as my proposal to enact, enact that into law in this country. And wouldn't that be, especially on the eve of the 150th anniversary of this country called Canada, wouldn't that be a great gift to all of us, both indigenous and all indigenous. I say that because uh, I think it's important that for the first, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity in 2017 to, to celebrate together for the first time. And my bill it proposes to adopt into law the fundamental rights of the First Peoples of this country, the basic human rights of the First Peoples of this country. Nothing less, but nothing more. Nothing more. Um, I want to be brief because usually this presentation lasts uh, some 45 minutes uh, because I want time for <coughs> dialogue, question and answer afterwards. So um, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I come from, I usually say I come from Oswampi, but that's not exactly true because I was born on the land, like most people. Most priests in my generation, I was born on the land. Spent the first seven years and a half living the traditional way of life of my people, hunting, fishing, trapping, and gathering. So right up to the time I was taken away for the next 10 years of my life to residential school, the only language that I spoke, and you may have noticed that I speak it fluently, the only language that I spoke spoke, and in fact, even heard, was Cree. And one day, while I was taken away, like all the people of my generation, to a residential school where I spent the next 10 years, I came over there exactly not knowing what to do, because, you know, when, when a person goes through that traumatic experience of being taken away, uh, I say kidnapped from their culture, their traditions, their homeland, their parents, um, their community. It's a pretty traumatic experience. And when you come out of that, especially after 10 years, as in my case, well, you don't know exactly what to do. Because much of you was taken away during that time. So I decided to do exactly the only thing I knew what to do best was go back out on the land for the next two years. Until one day I was in the, in the community and, and the chief of that time, <clears throat> this is 1985, the chief of the time approached me as I was walking in the streets of Oswampi and said, listen Romeo, there's an important conference going on in Montreal. It's going to deal with the James Bay North Quebec Agreement, the first modern treaty signed with indigenous peoples in this country, 10 years after, because the agreement was signed in 1975. And he said, well, pay for your expenses, pay for your travel, your room, registration, why don't you come? This should be of interest to you. And on the second day of that conference, second day of that conference, there was this panel of the different lawyers that represented the different parties in the fight against James Bay in courts, but also in the negotiations that led to the James Bay <coughs> and Northern Quebec Agreement. So as I was listening to the lawyer that represented Canada, Quebec, Hydro-Quebec, the Inuit people, and the Cree people, I was listening to James O'Reilly, who represented the Cree, talking about Cree history, talking about Cree people talking about Cree rights. And I said to myself, at that very moment, at that very moment, 
And I really said, that went in my head. I said, fuck, I can do that too. <laughs> so I went out to Oslo after that. And I completed, uh, as we both mentioned, uh, my law degree in 1989, first degree to ever achieve that <coughs> in Northern Quebec. I was also the first degree member from Northern Quebec to, to, uh, to be elected to Parliament. I'm also the first, and not too many people know this, I'm also the first indigenous person to ever run for leadership of a major political party in this country. So, to make a long story short, I, I, I first met late Jack Lake in 2006, approached me then to consider the possibility of eventually running for the NDP. And this was in 2006, I was never ready, but uh, <coughs> finally accepted to run in 2011, and the rest is history. There's a lot of work to be done on indigenous issues in, in this country, even in 2016. Let me tell you that after 35, experience, 35 years of experience in this area, I can tell you there's a lot to be done. But when there's good faith, when there's a will, political will, to do things that may seem complicated or complex, there is a way. And I got that from your presentation. And then I got that from experience as well. I was deputy grand chief between 1990 and 1993. Crucial years for indigenous peoples in this country. You may recall the Oka crisis. You may recall the constitutional crisis in this country. Maybe you don't know, but during those years, the Cree, my people, fought against the second phase of the James Bay project, which we defeated this time because we said, how can we accept another major project that will destroy our environment, our lands, affect our way of life, if the first agreement was never respected? And we took a stand, and we defeated that project after five years of long fight between 1990 and 1994. So a lot happened during the years I was stepping for the Cree for a guy who wanted to go on and do a master's degree in political science. I did it on the ground. <clears throat> um, briefly about the, the process that led to the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Not too many people know that this process lasted 23 years. We sat in Geneva together, 10 days a year, uh, with nation states or governments and indigenous organizations and representatives on the other hand. It was the biggest forum every year within the UN system. We had from 600 to 1,200 participants every year. So imagine, you can imagine how difficult it is to negotiate a UN declaration with so many participants. So we had to, we had to be imaginative in that process. But it took a long time as well because there are a lot of issues that were difficult for uh, member states to accept. From the outset, for instance, the notion of peoples for them was not applicable. Indigenous people were not peoples like other peoples. They wanted to call us populations in the UN Declaration. Well, that took a good 10 years of debate, discussion, and negotiation to get accepted finally. And when we achieved that, just that one word, in fact, I, I got thrown out of the international um, forum on human rights, international, the, the UN Conference on Human Rights in 1992 in Vienna because I protested because the, the UN system would not recognize indigenous peoples as peoples. So when the time came for a discussion on indigenous peoples of the world at the World Forum on Human Rights, I brought my ass with me and held it up and they threw me out because of that. I'm proud of that. 
The second challenge was, of course, under international law, only peoples have a right to self-determination. That's what we were striving for as a recognition, again, for many, many years within that process. Uh, they eventually said, after five years of debate and discussion, okay, maybe you have a right to self-determination, but it cannot be the same right of self-determination as other peoples under international law. So you understand why it took 23 years, because there are a lot of concepts in international law that nation states did not believe were applicable to indigenous peoples throughout, throughout the planet. There are over 370 million indigenous individuals throughout 72 countries around the world. And this declaration was all about their human rights. The third biggest challenge we have, briefly, and I don't think I'll need, I'll need to explain why, are provisions, Article 25 and following, that deal with lands, territories, and resources. You, I think you guess why those provisions were difficult to negotiate, but read them carefully when, whenever you have a moment to read the UN Declaration. You'll see the balancing act that we had to achieve in the negotiation of those provisions. On the one hand, the rights of indigenous peoples, their traditional lands, territories, and resources, but on, on the other hand, the rights of others that now live in Canada. I've always had in mind in negotiating those provisions the importance of what former Just Chief Justice Lemaire said, I believe, in Dublin or, or Sparrow. At the end of the, the ruling, Justice Lemaire said, we are all here to stay. And that's equally true for reconciliation today. We are all in this together. And I'm proud to see so many non-Indigenous in this room, and some Indigenous as well. <clears throat> because that's important, we need this dialogue to happen amongst ourselves. Um, when we finally achieve consensus with respect to the Declaration, the Human Rights Commission had to accept it and adopt it. That happened in June 2007. And the UN Human Rights Commission referred it to the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly, for consideration and adoption. And that would happen in September 2007. The anniversary is coming up on, on the 13th next. <clears throat> what many people don't know either is that once the UN Human Rights Commission adopted it and referred it to the General Assembly the following September, there were two blocks of countries at the UN that did not participate in the process and therefore did not know what they were going to vote on in September. The Asian bloc and the African bloc. Those two blocks together make up the majority of the UN General Assembly. So imagine for a moment, imagine for a moment the intense lobbying that went on by the governments that would vote against the declaration and that included our country, along with the US, New Zealand, and Australia that following September. And of course, we have to do our part in that lobbying. Many times between June and September, I traveled to New York to meet with the ambassadors to explain the declaration and to respond to their concerns, if they had any concerns or questions about the declaration. And the result, after the vote in June, uh, September 2007, was overwhelming, of course. Even on that level, at, uh, at the lobby, although we know very well that Canada, the US, Australia, and New Zealand had much more resources than we did as an indigenous organization. 
but we did our part. We did, we did uh, our effort in that sense. So when I got elected in 2011, my first initiative uh, for a private member's bill was to get all laws of Canada uh, <clears throat> to be in compliance with the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So Bill C-644 was defeated in second reading in 2014 because the Conservatives, conservatives uh, decided to vote against. Um, so, having been re-elected in 2015, last year, everybody knew that I was going to bring it back. But fortunately, <clears throat> during that period of time, new developments happened. And one of them is the Truth and the Reconciliation Commission. So, as it was pointed out earlier, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and S94 calls to action. And the fundamental ones are 43 and 44. 44 calls on the government of Canada in collaboration with Indigenous peoples to develop a national action plan for the implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. 43, you saw silent tech calls on the government of Canada, the provinces, the territories, and the municipalities to fully adopt and implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. And that's important. So no government can say, well, we basically agree with all 94 except, except 43. We have a slight problem. We might you know, slightly, slightly modify that call to action. No, TRC calls for full adoption and full implementation. You implement through policies and programs you adopt through legislation. And this is what C262 is all about. You might have heard throughout the campaign, the last federal campaign, the many promises that different parties made with respect to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And the Liberal Party did it. My own party did it, did it as well. But unfortunately for me, another party got elected, and, uh, but they still promised to implement the Declaration as <coughs> as the top priority for the renewed relationship with indigenous peoples. The letters of mandate to the ministers refer to the same thing. The letters to Minister Bennett, Aboriginal Affairs, Minister, Minister Wilson Rabel, Minister of Justice, calls for them to implement the UN Declaration as a top priority, as what the letter says, for the new relationship with Indigenous peoples. Um, what is kind of odd at this point in time, and I've, I've listened to the government uh, of Canada, what is kind of odd is that different ministers say different things about what they intend to do with the UN Declaration and what the government intends to do. You may recall that the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs at the UN in just last May said that Canada is now fully committed to adopt and implement the UN Declaration. Carolyn Bennett said that. One paragraph. The other paragraph, she says, we're committed to implement the UN Declaration in the context of the Constitution of Canada. Um, the following July, just this past July, at the 71st Nations General Assembly, the Minister of Justice said the contrary. She said that legislating the UN Declaration is simplistic and unworkable. My response was, well, they certainly made the UN Act workable. How can they cannot do this with the UN Declaration? So I think what needs to be said at this point is what I said right after the election 
and I want to go into the question and answer. What, what I said in my first interview after the, the election was that, you know, I've heard all the promises. I've heard all the commitments that they made during the campaign, after the campaign, after the election. And I said, I'm not a, really a partisan guy, so I won't doubt their sincerity right off the bat. But however, as a member of parliament, in the opposition, I have a duty to test that sincerity. This is what Bill 262 is going to do. This is going to be the true test for the true government with respect to that. I've always said <clears throat> that reconciliation in the absence of justice is not possible. You know, a lot of us talk about respect of Aboriginal rights, recognition of Aboriginal, Aboriginal rights, reckoning, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. All well, those three R's will not, will not, in the absence of those three R's, it will not bring us to justice in this country. And I've always, I thought, I've always thought that there's a lot of challenges for me as an Aboriginal MP right now in that institution. One of them is my language. One of the first questions I asked to the clerk of the house was sort of the boss of the procedure and, and roles of the parliament. I asked if I could do my questions in Cree, do my statements in Cree, uh, do my speeches in Cree house. And I was told that, uh, of course, to answer, I expected French and English are the only official languages in this place. <clears throat> so I've been discussing for over five years with the clerk, clerk of the house on, on that particular issue, but that's between me and I. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll, we'll, get, we'll get somewhere somehow uh, with good faith and, and will. And it's, it's, it's possible. But let me finish by saying that I think as we approach the 150 years of this country, we owe ourselves that justice to the first peoples of this country. We owe ourselves that. We owe it to our children and grandchildren. And one of the lessons I learned from the experience living up in, the, in my traditional ter territory in Northern Quebec, we call EUSG, is that once you recognize and respect rights of indigenous peoples, relations become harmonious. Harmony is restored. And surprisingly, if you look up Black, Black Law Dictionary, look up reconciliation just for fun. It talks about restoring harmony between things and people that are in conflict. Look at that. I'm very serious. And everybody acknowledges that today in Quebec. Whenever everything is not going so well economically or politically in Quebec, well, surprise, surprise, it's going very well in northern Quebec, both politically and economically. Well, that comes from the recognition and respect for Indigenous peoples' rights, because that is what forges harmonious partnerships and harmonious relations between peoples. And I hope that uh, I'll continue my work on this, on this bill. It's up for our debate sometime next spring and vote on second reading, perhaps early, early summer. And I'm still hoping that the Liberal members of Parliament that voted in favor of the first bill will again vote in favor of this second one. That's the challenge that we have before us. I just want to mention as a point of information that uh, 
there was a specific there is a specific website, um, and the name of the website is adopt and implement in one word dot com, and there is a petition online petition there that you can sign on. Very few people know that there are few, that the most signatures for a petition to a parliament to date in the history of parliament. You know which one? 34,000. And it was, it was a petition asking the government of Canada, introduced by a conservative MP, a petition calling on the government of Canada to protect and promote the oil and gas industry. Now, Bill C-262 about, is about the fundamental basic human rights of the first peoples of this country. If we cannot get more than 34,000 signatures for this petition, there's something wrong with us. Possible approvals of pipelines 
are what we in the West actually want. And last week, the RMG Murray Rankin spoke so eloquently to the National Energy Board panel that about the, the need to wake up and turn down that trans mountain pipeline. And the NED seems to still be structured along the lines of the Harper government's formulations. And I'm just wondering if our two MPs here could comment on what is going on and whether there's some way of linking deeper concerns east and west that, that really live up to the, the UNDRA, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Thank you. Would you like to take a stab at that? I'm going to go first. Well, <clears throat> yeah. I should say that we're going to be in Montreal, uh, Romeo and I, for a, a caucus meeting uh, in the next next week. And th at that time, there'll be a federal court case where uh, the issue, believe it or not, of BC Hydro and Indigenous rights will be will be coming up. Why it's in Montreal is a bit of a mystery to me, but it is. <laughs> so we intend to go there, and we intend to let you know on how we, as the NDP, feel about that project. I must say, I'm deeply disappointed in the federal government government uh, granting permits under the Fisheries Act and the Navigable Waters Protection Act in order to allow Site C to occur. I, I must say I was very surprised and it's really hard for me to believe that the Conservative government did the due diligence on accommodation required under, under, under the Section 35 of the Constitution to allow that project to go ahead. I find it very, very disturbing that our Minister of Justice having been at the paddle for the peace many times, is in a government that appears to be full steam ahead with Site C. That's just a personal view, but I'm very disappointed. So we're going to continue to fight the good fight on that. And of course, you've already heard me on how I feel about Kinder Morgan, and we'll be very actively involved in that. But I want to say that in each of those projects, it's First Nations leadership that has led to us having a real good chance of, of fighting back. And I think it's really key that we recognize that it's a partnership, this harmony that Romeo talked about, really starts in the courtrooms. It's, it's the First Nation cases that are, frankly, the most potent in our fight against this government. So I think that needs to be acknowledged. Romeo? Well, very briefly, I totally agree with what um, Rory just said. But from a personal Point of view, um, you know, I expressed not not real hope <clears throat> that things would change after this election because I've seen it all and I've heard it all. I've heard all the promises and commitments throughout my career, over 35 years, and I also know that history has shown us throughout the history of this country, the federal government has been an adversary to the rights. Indigenous peoples and to the Indigenous peoples' status throughout the 150 years of history of this country. So I was, I, I'm not surprised, disappointed, certainly, just like worried about the attitude <clears throat> of this new federal government, but I'm not surprised. And this attitude is not in keeping with reconciliation, what was promised about a new relationship with the Indigenous peoples. These court cases have to cease. Uh, this attitude has to stop. Um, I've asked during my first term to each department how much money they budgeted or and spent <coughs> fighting Aboriginal rights in courts for the last 12 years. Well, I didn't get an answer. And each and every department answered with the same, same line, very short. We don't keep that kind of data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's going to, it's going to be very hard to, to change that kind of attitude. I'm fighting for it. And um, I'm going to continue to fight until it stops because uh, and, and this case of cost, animal cost, fighting Aboriginal rights uh, has gone up to the Auditor General now. He's accepted to review uh, the situation because as I argued, it's not keeping reconciliation. And one of the things that I also know is that many times in the US, when, when the Supreme Court is called upon to 
rule on the financial right case in the U.S. The U.S. government usually acts as an uncoordinated friend of the court, and usually, well, all the time, has argued in favor of radical rights. This has not happened in this country, so things have to change. When someone asked me uh, in one of the public meetings I've had <clears throat> out east, you know, what is, what is this all about? You know, you've been at this for 35 years. We've negotiated the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Well, I said, first of all, it's about patience. But I'm getting old, so I'm losing a lot of that. <laughs> but second and most importantly, perhaps, this is all about reconciliation. This is about justice. This is about human rights. And I asked that person, what are you doing about those things? So I said, please support my bill. That's, that's the, this, that I think, Bill C-262, in my mind, is probably the most important legislation that the Parliament of Canada will have, will have to consider in a very long time. The most important legislation that the Parliament of Canada will have to consider in a very long time. In 150 years of this country, it's definitely an opportunity, I think, to move on together. Well, can I just ask a follow-up and bring people's hands are up? But uh, yesterday, earlier today, uh, Minister Wilson Rabel told a gathering of the BC cabinet ministers and First Nation leaders that it's important to appreciate why Canada cannot incorporate the declaration word for war where it aims a lot. Is, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond. Is that what your bill would do? And if so, can we ever get the Liberal government to go along with your, with your bill? No, I watched this guy in every question period in the house, and I always appreciated his tough questions. <laughs>
for allowing us to be here today. Um, and I want to say thank you, Romeo, for coming. I always look forward to coming to see him. I'm sorry I didn't bring you moose meat tonight, but I had it. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, will the UN Declaration have any effect or change the Indian Act? Well, let's, let me say first of all that uh, I listened carefully to the Prime Minister of Canada speak to the Assembly of First Nation Chiefs, chiefs uh, in December of last year. His own, in fact, it was his first in, in, among many, but first intervention before the uh, Assembly of First Nations. And he committed to five things. And among, uh, among them, uh, his commitment to review legislation that was unilaterally imposed on indigenous peoples in this country by previous governments. I listened to them carefully. One lawyer, I listened to words carefully. So that's what he committed to. So you have to do that, I think. I think that's one of the one of the legislation that we have to review jointly on a nation to nation basis. Um, <clears throat> Justice Murray, uh, former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and now Senator has sent me a letter of endorsement for my bill. And he talks about, in his letter, and you'll find it on that, on that website that I, <clears throat> that I gave you, he talks about the legislative war that the federal government since Confederation has waged on indigenous peoples in this country. The legislative war. <clears throat> and leading that war, he says in the letter, is the Indian Act. So of course it has to change. Uh, what form will that take? It's really up to the First Nations of this country. Um, and speaking of nation to nation, I can give you an example of what, how I understand nation to nation when discussing these issues. In the JCP North and Connect Agreement, Chapter 9 talks about local government of decree. Um, because the desire of the decree when we negotiated the case pain or the Quebec agreement was to do away with the Indian Act. That was the demand of the Cree people. That was the demand of the negotiators, Cree negotiators at that table. We wanted to get out of the Indian Act and have something else. Well, you know what? We asked that this be done on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. And the Cree Scampi Act, which replaced the Indian Act for the Cree North the Quebec, was negotiated article by article and accepted article by article before it was introduced in the House. That's what nation to nation is all about. And it's one of the very few federal legislations in this country that was negotiated on a nation to nation basis. That's what needs to happen. And I know that uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of reluctance on, on the part of uh, indigenous communities throughout the country because they don't know exactly what to replace the Indian Act with, and that's quite understandable. We, we fear, uh, normally we fear the unknown. So, um, but there's nothing preventing us from negotiating a framework agreement or a framework legislation where each individual nation can opt in eventually when they're ready and negotiate particular particularities for their nations. Well, there's a lot of, um, we're, we're uh, if there's, when there's a will, when there's, if there's a way, always, uh, I found in, in my years as, as a negotiator. So if, uh, you know, this country does not lack imagination, political imagination. Well, I, I don't think so. I hope not. And that this could happen. And it's taking piece by piece and doing away with these, with these pieces of legislation that were proposed unilaterally. Indigenous peoples in this country that will bring about that reconciliation. So, 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 can I just say something? Well, we've got a lot of other speakers, but yeah. if you wouldn't mind just making it very short. So, that's my biggest fear, Romeo, is with uh, the UN Declaration is uh, dismantling the Indian Act, and what will that look like? It's not going to dismantle the Indian Act. If, the, if it's the desire, to know. <laughs> if it's the desire of the First Nations to do it, at their pace, at their rhythm, 
according to their priorities, that's that's how it should happen. That's how it's going to happen. So we make sure to make sure. Yeah. Thank you both for your presentation. I'd like to ask I'd like to ask Romeo, uh, what specifically in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People so troubles uh, white colonial nation states? Would you would you hammer the nail home and let us know what is it that is so 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 troubling? <clears throat> yeah, it's an important question. It's a question that, uh, that has come often during, during the public forums that I've held throughout, throughout the country. And I think the, the element that is, uh, that is feared the most in the UN, UN Declaration is the provision, provisions that talk about free prior and informed consent. Now we were talking about corporations earlier, and I know that that's where the fear is coming from. They're, they're getting a lot of pressure, they're being lob lobbied heavily uh, right now <clears throat> since they've committed to the UN, UN Declaration. Uh, I think corporations uh, throughout the country uh, <clears throat> have concerns about that. And I can give you two examples. Uh, when we had our, our, uh, <clears throat> our convention in Edmonton, I met with uh, two or three ministers that I last meetings with. And in both cases, I met them separately. In both cases, the first question was, what does free prior informed consent imply? What does it mean? I've, I've also um, <clears throat> submitted an, an access to information request uh, since after the election. So between, between November to last summer, I wanted to know I wanted to see every document of this new government that talked about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Free Prior to Informed Consent, Romeo Saganash, C262. Okay? I've asked for all the information, and the government invoked that delay clause because there's too much documentation to respond directly to mine in that short period of time. Um, but every time I meet either with ministers or corporations, and they do meet it wrong, I, I never refuse to meet on, on, on my private member's bill. I do explain, take the time to explain to them that the notion of consent is already in Canadian constitutional law. The Supreme Court of Canada has talked about consent over and over again, uh, Gotham most recently, as early as 2004, in the Hyde Nation case, Supreme Court says that on important matters, on important matters, we need a full consent of Indigenous peoples before proceeding. So it's already part of Canadian law. And, and I've also mentioned that even the concept of reconciliation, the Supreme Court has, has talked about that as well, even before the TRC existed was created. And in terms of reconciliation, the Supreme Court had this to say. The objective is to, and I'm quoting them directly, to reconcile the pre-existing sovereignty of indigenous peoples with the assumed sovereignty of the crown. The assumed sovereignty of the crown. That's a pretty powerful uh, statement from the Supreme Court. It came as early as 2004, again. So everything is there. The, the, the slate, the constitutional slate, is ready for, has been ready for us for many years. And I'm hoping that uh, I can meet as many uh, corporations as possible on this bill as well, because they deserve uh, also, uh, to, to get that information as well. Because no one's giving them that information. In that, in that small amount of information I got, from the access to information request. I have, well, they're fully, almost fully redacted, but uh, I have at least at the agenda items of the first meeting of the Federal Minister of Aboriginal Affairs with Premier Christy Clark. And guess what? Among the five items that, that are on top of the list, 
is the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, free prior to informed consent, and call to action 43. <laughs> Believe it or not. So that's where the concern is. And uh, you know, I know for a fact, even if uh, I wasn't given any information, that uh, the heavy lobbying that's going on with this new government. I mean, just look at this entourage right now <coughs> to get the rash and the PM more on them. I think you'll easily guess where that's coming from. By the way, I've been told I have a few more minutes, so don't we panic. We don't have to go quite as quickly. The not pumpkins exactly at 8.30. Heather? Well, my question was going to be related to free fire informed consent. So I'll make this really quick. But I wanted to look at um, how industry manipulates, first of all, um, the duty to consult and accommodate. I heard recently on the radio a CEO from Industry at BC saying, well, it's not our job to accommodate, that's the government job, so we'll just do what we're going to do. So they sort of pass it off. And even with free informed prior consent, which has a lot more weight, and I really applaud your bill because it can even add more weight, I think it's needed. But there are still ways that industry manipulates the idea of consent. And they do it by perhaps talking to a portion of community, so, but not everybody in community. So how can we strengthen and add weight to free prior informed consent, both nationally and internationally? Because as a mining justice activist, I look at this all the time in cases with indigenous communities where they claim they've received consent, but actually haven't, and just spoken to a few representatives. So how can we kind of create um, a strong blueprint for defining what consent is? Should it be uh, a certain percentage of the community? Should it be sort of a referendum to community? Is it enough to go to certain leaders um, where other leaders are ignored? I still see so many ways that industry manipulates both, both duty to consult and accommodate and free prior informed consent. So I'm really excited about your bill because if it can bring it you know, deeper into law, then I still think it's really needed. So. Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, by the way, I, I need to mention this, uh, and I, I do it. I do it all the time. <clears throat> the UN Declaration does not talk about veto. Uh, the UN Declaration negotiators explicitly excluded that word because veto implies uh, absolute, um, complete, and arbitrary powers uh, without no balancing of, of rights as our court system or legal systems work, uh, both domestically and internationally. So that's important to understand. Um, <clears throat> people seem to use that, uh, and corporations seem to use a lot, uh, that, well, use the word veto as, as a fear, uh, fear factor in, in this debate. And uh, <clears throat> so we need to understand that concept. I want to read to you, um, there's an ex expert mechanism at the UN on indigenous peoples that has been in existence for 10 years. And, and it's under the Human Rights Committee. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, they, did a, they did a study on free prior informed consent and what it should mean. Uh, and these are experts in international law. <clears throat> and so they sort of bro broken down the, the, three, uh, the three words. Uh, free implies no coercion, intimidation, or manipulation. Uh, prior implies that consent is obtained in advance of the activity taking place. And informed, um, this implies providing indigenous peoples with all the information that is objective, in advance, accurate, and in a way that is understandable to indigenous peoples. For a long time in Northern Quebec, for instance, Hydro Quebec would provide studies uh, uh, in French only to the Cree. And we always ask for Cree versions of those studies. Uh, so, you know, there, there was a disconnect there. And finally, the expert mechanism, this is a 2011 study, uh, no, 2000, yeah, 2011 study, 
And finally, they say that consent implies that indigenous peoples have agreed to the activity which may be subject to conditions. So even then, we do not mention veto. Contrary to what the Prime Minister said during the campaign when asked, when asked about this, and he was asked directly uh, in the interview with APTN, I believe, does for indigenous peoples, does no mean no? And his answer was absolutely. So that's probably why so many lobbyists will rush to Ottawa after the election to tell them that this should not be. Because that's what's happening right now. One more question, and then I promise I give the opportunity to those who want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with either of us the chance to do so. So let me stop. Let, let you have the last word. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, it's a question for Romeo. Thank you for being here tonight. And also for Mary Anna and Murray to making this happen. So you mentioned about there was a constant that this bill linked uh, uh, come up against constitutional issues. Uh, I'm guessing that there's going to be resistance from other MPs because it's not passing a constitutional test. And I'm curious what that kind of means because I wasn't sure what, what they had what they'd spoken to in terms of why is it not going to meet the constitutional test because that's kind of our highest, or the state's highest law. I don't recall talking about the constitutional test, but, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to, to respond to that question in another way. Um, when when the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was uh, <coughs> uh, uh, incorporated into the Constitution of Canada, guess what the, uh, the opponents of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms were arguing that this was going to be unworkable. Same words today. Um, and I also note that um, within our system right now, um, the Ministry of Justice under the Department of Justice Act, Article 4.1, has to make sure that any legislation before it's introduced in the House of Commons is in compliance with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We don't have the equivalent for Aboriginal and treaty rights in this country. My bill would achieve that. So bills like what the former uh, Conservative government proposed for instance, on First Nations Control, First Nations Education Act, would not have been possible if we had that compliance test within our system for Indigenous rights, both Aboriginal and Treaty and basic human rights. Um, one of the comments I've often heard from this government um, from the outset was, well, we have to consult the Aboriginal peoples about the UN Declaration. Well, this was 23 years in the making. It's almost a decade since it was adopted now, so we're talking through 30 years now. Um, what are we going to consult about? If, if we're allowed to protect our language, our culture, if we're allowed to have clean water in our reserves, if we're allowed to have, if I accept to abandon my right to have a roof over my head, no, I don't think that's, that's reasonable. So I think when you look at all the, um, if, you're, if we're going to talk about consultation and accommodation with respect to this bill, um, the number of indigenous organizations that have, that have endorsed this bill to date represent approximately close to a million indigenous individuals throughout the country. So there's overwhelming support and the petition is being signed both by indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. So I think, I, I think, and I've said this before, I don't think it would be a good way for, for this government to say, well, we're not sure about your bill, we're not sure about Call to Action 43, we're going to do it our way, we're going to have, as the Minister of Natural Resources has said before, we're going to have a Canadian version of the UN Declaration on the Rights of the Indigenous Peoples. That would be the wrong way to do it. Uh, the TRC did not talk about adopting another version of the UN Declaration. We're talking about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I believe that C262 is the way forward 
Romulo, could you just tell us one more time the name of that website? So I make sure we got it. It's adopt and implement in one word dot com. Right. Because the electronic version of the petition is there. I do have paper copies here if, if you wish to sign it right away. Be much. So on that note, I'd like to do a three sets of thank yous, a plug, and a concluding remark. The uh, three sets of thank yous are, of course, number one and two for Marianne and for Romeo. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was great. Number two, I want to thank you for pulling this off and making it, I think, such a success. I want to thank Maura, Elise, Man, and Caitlin in particular for all of your hard work. <laughs> participating in probably one of the most crucial issues of our time, reconciliation. I, I take away from a, take away from a two really important observations. One, I didn't know at all that next year, 2017, is the year of reconciliation right here in our in our community. And I'm really grateful to Marianne for all the work she, and leadership she's shown in that. And I hope we can participate in a whole bunch of ways. And the second quote I, I took down is from Romeo, reconciliation in the absence of justice is not possible. It's very powerful words, and I appreciate you saying them. I want to end with a plug. A plug on uh, Saturday, this Saturday, September the 10th, at Vic High, between 3 and 5. We're having another forum on electoral reform. Hope that's of interest to many of you. We have at that uh, Terry Dan Spenick of Fair Vote Canada. We have uh, Professor Abigail Eisenberg from the University of Victoria Political Science Department. And Nathan Cullen, MP and MP. NDP just a critic for electoral reform. Three to five at Vic High. I hope some of you will be able to be there. Thank you all for coming. Feel free, any of you who would like to ask any other questions on an informal basis, to do so now. Thanks again for coming. Out.